How y'all doing today? Good. Good. All right. Well, glad to be here. Um, I like to dialogue a lot, so I'll give some initial words and then want to open it up for question and answer. All right. I tell people, ask a question, just be prepared for the answer. All right. So uh, if you feel confident in your question, just be prepared for the answer that's going to be given. Okay. Sometimes. It's not the most comforting thing, but sometimes it is the most comforting thing. If you see something good, say, all right, good. You know, I'm a preacher by calling, all right? So in the tradition of the black church, is that call and response? If you're like, hey, that's great, then that's fine. It's not going to bother me a bit, all right? I'll talk back to you. Sound good? All right, so uh, for me, uh, what's the most important question is, what does it mean to be human? Uh, that is a question... Uh, that I've uh, sought to answer for myself the last 12 years that uh, I have lived here in Conway, Arkansas, moved here, <coughs> myself, my wife, and three kids back in 2007 coming out of the military. I was a combat officer, uh, deployed in Iraq and some other fun places. Uh, and then when we moved to Arkansas, I was called to a trailer park called Oakwood Village down on Robbins Street off of Park Rider. And there, God called me to do ministry in that trailer park. And over time, uh, it blossomed from uh, simply being a, a street preacher, a preacher under a tree. She said, I've been called many names, been called cult leader, um, troublemaker, all those types of things. All because I began to understand that the gospel was not just about how does one understand uh, one's uh, experience in life with God beyond this world, but also what does it mean to walk and love God in this world and with people especially who are not like you. And in that context of neighbor, of what Jesus talks about, uh, he frames that in the context of someone who is not like you. And, and that question is a different ethnicity, but how it applies today, not just a different ethnicity, but a different economic situation, a different nationality, a different political ideology. That is your neighbor. That is the person that you are to love. So what you love someone who votes like you? So what you love someone who has the same nationality as you? Who has the same economic situation as you? Jesus was like, okay. He said the power of love, the justice of love, is when you love someone who is not like you. And so, uh, for me, public service is uh, a very uh, important thing. Two reflections. 2015, Emilio and Nancy Marcial were an older couple, disabled couple, who were living in the Oakwood Trailer Park. And they had a granddaughter, and this granddaughter, uh, she was taken from them because of their living conditions. They were very poor, toilet was not working, uh, the floor was falling in in the house that they were renting. Okay, the landlord was not doing much for that house, but they wanted their granddaughter back. Their mom, her mom was incarcerated, her dad was nowhere to be found. Uh, Emilio uh, was wheelchair bound, w, double amputee. Uh, Nancy uh, was taking care of him, but their living conditions were not the best. And it was at th this point, what does love look like? What does love look like for this couple who did not look like me? The only relation that we had, proximity that we had, was that the three of us grew up in California from Southern California, all right, and they were from Southern California. When we found out, a friendship developed, and then they said, well, we got this court order, and we have a year to get our whole life in order so that we can get our granddaughter back, and so what does it mean to be human? And so what we did was got the court order, and we worked through that entire list with the DHS uh, caseworker so that they could get their granddaughter back. And so that meant moving them. That meant finding a place for them to live. That meant working with their new landlord to get a wheelchair ramp built because there was not one for uh, Emilio. That meant getting all new furniture because the furniture they had was just not acceptable. 
it meant walking with them so that they could go through this counseling step that they needed that was court mandated so that in October they got their granddaughter back. What does it mean to be human? The city council starting 2015 received a request from you guys were just there at the ministry center to open a homeless shelter. And it was rejected by the city council. And the reason it was rejected was because affluence. Affluence. All right? For affluence and comfort, it was rejected. And I found myself, even though I don't work with or for the ministry center, there are my partners going before the city council and asking the city council, what kind of city are we going to be? We want to call ourselves a great city. That's kind of the new thing going on today. But if we want to be a great city, a city is measured not by how it takes care of those who have everything and can take care of themselves. A city will be measured by how it takes care of the poor, the widow, the orphan, the homeless. That's scripture, that's the trilogy of the poor. God judged those cities not by how affluent they were, but how they took care of the poor, the widow, the orphan, the stranger. A year later, two years later, another organization came through, Soul Food Cafe, asking to do the same thing again. We have a problem with homelessness. We need to present a solution, and they wanted to open a shelter down on South Donaghy. But once again, the loudest voices, affluence and comfort, and so Food Cafe said, hey, you know what? We'll just pull that back. What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be a leader in public service? So I uh, think it's very important. I'll draw this picture. Something I can understand. It. That we as human beings, or as a community, we exist in a variety of spheres of uh, space or geography, social setting, religious belief, economics, politics. <coughs> Focus on this. Today. What I began to understand, beginning with Emilio and Nancy, is that I can, and my organization can, provide food to people, all right? We can pay light bills, okay? We can fix floors, all right? But all of those are, if you will, band-aids on something else that is deeper. So we can give all of those things, and those things are needed. All right, we can give sack lunches and, and those kind of things and, and clothes and all of that, okay? But at some point, you have to move from charity to justice. Root word of justice is right use, all right? That because of who you are as a human being made in the image and likeness of God, all right, by virtue of who you are as a human being, nothing else. The fact that you have dignity and worth, the fact that you are remarkable, you are due justice. That you would have equal opportunity to live as you want to live as a human being, that you would flourish as a human being, or as it says, that you would live in peace. From a Jewish understanding, shalom, flourishing. That you have that opportunity, but when there are roadblocks in place, obstacles in place that prevent you from doing that, charity is not enough. Giving you a sack lunch is not enough. It just slows down your hunger. But the question is, how can I stop you from being hungry? <coughs> And so to do that, you have to at some point go into the political realm, the public sphere, 
at some point you have to engage with city council. At some point you have to engage with county judges and quorum court. At some point you have to engage with the legislature, even at the federal level, so that the system changes. The illustration I've heard, uh, uh, read a lot, is if you're standing at the bottom of a river and you see fish jumping out, right? Charity is, ooh, let's get the fish and throw them back in the water, right? Justice says, why are they jumping out? Let's go up to the top of the hill and see that there's a factory that's dumping into the water. That needs to change. Justice. Do you understand the difference there? So, the Declaration of Independence, one of the world's greatest social political documents. In there it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. They're endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights, namely life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness or human flourishing. Now, our government has fallen on its face many times because of that. Schizophrenic at best. Yes? Yes, sir. All men are created equal. Well, what men? Right? All men and women are created equal. Well, what all men and women are created equal? Is it based off of what they look like? Is it based on what they own? Is it based off of what they live? So justice is, from a public perspective, is how do we get life in American society, let's get in closer, how do we get life in Arkansas to as closely as possible resemble what that document says, that all men and women are created equal, that we've been endowed by our creator with some rights, yeah? So since we are created equal, then government at all levels must protect justice. Government is not supposed to punish us for doing the right thing, but government should create an opportunity so that people can do the right thing for one another. If I have a government that comes in and says, hey, you know what? I can't have you giving those sacrifices out to the homeless. That happened recently in San Diego, California. We can't have you doing that. What you can do is you go through all these Department of Health steps, then you can help the homeless. Well, I've been helping them already for years. I've been giving them food for years. Why do you set up all of these other barriers that slow down my opportunity to help somebody in need? Nicholas Walterstorff, he said this, that in a lecture he gave, what is justice and why does it matter? He stated that government's primary responsibility is secure justice on behalf of its citizens. So if you're intended to be a elected leader one day, your goal is not to get rich. Your goal is not to bend your ear to people that give you money and gave you campaign donations to get you in office. That is not why you are there. You are there as a servant to protect justice so that I and my wife and my kids and your family and your friends can flourish as human beings. Being. So you have to ask yourself, where is government preventing men and women from flourishing as human beings? Where is government preventing the homeless from being housed? Where is the government preventing people and children to be educated? Ask yourselves those tough questions. And sometimes it's going to put you at odds with those that are in your same ideology. But your role is to secure justice. I got a lot of thoughts. I'm just going to keep driving. <laughs> so, I believe one of the ways that this can be done is through nonprofits. 
I firmly believe, I adopt this concept from uh, Catholic social doctrine called subsidiarity, that at the lowest level, things can be accomplished. That at the lowest level, that when I am in Oakwood or in Brookside or in South Ash or in Mitchellville, this is in South Arkansas or Eudora, the people that know best what is going on with their community is those people that live there. Imagine me coming into your apartment or dorm room, walking in and looking around and be like, hey, you know what? I think it needs to be this color, the bed needs to be there, the computer needs to be there, and there, and there. How would you feel? Huh? But I'm here to help. I'm here to improve your life. Right? But who knows best about how your apartment or dorm room needs to be set up? You, right? Now, if you got some roommates, who knows best? You and your roommates, right? Now, if you come to me and you're like, hey, I heard you got this couch that kind of matches the color scheme in our apartment. You know, can we, you know, barter trade or can you give that to me? I'll be like, all right, we can do that, right? But see, that's, you initiated it, right? I helped you out, and then I'm like, I'm good. But you determine. You found the person, you found the color scheme, the couch is like, hey, we need to go to Philip and get that couch. Nonprofits are made up of people who have a discontent with how the world is. They see the world as it is, they offer some helpful criticism of that world, and they act then to make the world a better place. So if you are seeing something that just irks you, that just is, is gives you a holy discontent, what are you going to do about it? Now, you can do it yourself. Or, we'll go back to homelessness again, you can seek out organizations that are doing that already and say, hey, you know what, I want to jump all in and volunteer at said organization, whether it's Coho, the Ministry Center, Bethlehem House, the Women's Shelter, Central Arkansas that helps abuse women and children. It could be substance abuse, and there's Renewal Ranch, or there's homeless women who deal with substance abuse, it's Harbor House. If that is your thing that is bothering you, then you have to ask yourself, do I need to do this, or do you need to lock arms with somebody else? Do I need to be in solidarity with another organization so that we can make something happen? Now, I know as college students, because I've worked for the last 12 years, you feel as if you can do everything. Maybe. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, I'd rather you find a few things to do them well than try to do a thousand things and not do them as well. But in this age of social media, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, where we have all these things coming at us, human trafficking, homelessness, hungry kids, this, 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 you're like, you can get overwhelmed and be like, you know what? I don't think I can do anything. And some people feel that way. And so they sit in the corner overwhelmed, mourning the situation <laughs> of the society. But then there are others who swing the other direction and try to do everything. And then they burn out, have a heart attack, something. <laughs> but if you can find what your calling is for this specific time and answer that, and then lock arms with other people who are doing the exact same thing, imagine the change that you can be a part of. So I've had the privilege of working with a lot of Hendrick students who come to our organization, who have interned, and who have done uh, some great things. They've created curriculum, created assessments, so that we can get an understanding of our communities that we work with. I have one now who graduated who was a volunteer at Hendricks, from Hendricks. Then she became an intern. Then she left. 
Then she came back, and now she's my assistant director for community development, right? This is the impact that you can have because for her, she found what her niche was. And she said, I'm gonna go all in on this. And just like public service, don't go in for the money. Nonprofits don't go in for the money. It won't keep you, all right? It's the calling that keeps you. And so interacting with government, public service, and as a nonprofit leader, it requires you, it has required me to speak prophetically. What do I mean? That is being able to look at a mayor or a city council, knowing that, hey, like two days ago, we was hanging out, having coffee at Tateo or Blue Sale or something like that. How you doing? How's the kids? And then stand there and say, hey, you know what? Y'all wrong. <laughs> and say it in a manner that it, uh, you're affirming their dignity and worth. You're affirming the dignity and worth of the people that you're representing. Because at the end of the day, you want to make your opponents your allies. And that was one of the principles of Dr. Martin Luther King in the nonviolent struggle. That the goal was to make your opponent your ally that your enemy would truly be your neighbor. To be able to understand the situation that you're talking about, number two, that when you speak to a public leader, or you're involved in public office, or you're a nonprofit person, or you're just someone who is advocating, get a good sense of what you are advocating for. Understand and communicate your position, but also this. Understand and be able to communicate your opposition's position. Honor them in that. They have a reason they feel that way. So, for example, when the ministry center was uh, seeking to open their crisis shelter back in uh, 2015, uh, two of the major businesses, they're Covington and Salter. Okay? All right? Theirs was about business interests. All right? But you have to be able to demonstrate with facts and research that when homeless shelters have been put in business areas, crime did not go up. There was a Harvard study done in Denver. And in fact, it actually helped the situation. Be able to articulate your opponent's position. Be able to honor their position, but then also be able to provide an appropriate solution to what is being uh, proposed. So our city, our county, our state government needs effective leaders like yourself. It needs effective nonprofit leaders. It needs effective volunteers. It needs people who have loving and just voices who will be able to speak on behalf of those who have no voice, but also create an opportunity for those who need to have a voice to be able to create the opportunity for them to come into that space and then speak for themselves. Do you hear me when I say that? There's a time when we can speak for those who have no voice, but then we should also work towards creating a situation in which those who have no voice can have a voice and we put them in the space to speak and we step aside. Because they become their greatest advocates. And that's moving from charity to justice. And we have to remember this, is that we have a commonality. We're all tied together, and I love to do this because it's South African philosophy. Everybody say Ubuntu. Say it, Ubuntu. In other words, I cannot be who I'm going to be as a person if you are not going to be who you're going to be as a person. That means I depend on you. I cannot understand love by myself. If you lock me in a room, I cannot understand love. 
But if you put me and JJ in a room, all right, I can understand agape love, sacrificial love, love that says, I want to make the other better. And then in return, the other is going to make me better. Say Ubuntu. Or as it said in scripture, let us make man and woman in our image and likeness. They would be fruitful and multiply and cover the earth. But they can only understand that. That's two, and it's four, and it's eight, and so on and so forth. We need each other. And so when you go into public service, either as an elected official, or as a nonprofit, or as a volunteer, or whatever occupation that you're going to have once you leave this institution of higher learning, do not forget that at the end of the day, you use those to affirm the dignity and worth of human beings, that we are subjects, not objects. Thank you. And I'll take a question. Thank you. Thank you. So if you got any questions on anything I just talked about or something related in that, got a few moments. Yes, sir, tell me your name and what year you are in your question. Um, all right. Um, I'm curious what guys do on your apps and community service, like what you're doing in campus. Yeah, so um, by uh, prior to 2007, uh, my professional training was combat. So uh, I tell people uh, prior to moving here, I was trained to take life. Um, and now I've been trained to give life, if you will. Um, and so I didn't know what I was doing. Like, I did not, I only knew, like, hey, you go there, destroy that, or, you know, take that person, right? That's all, what I knew, what? And um, a friend of mine, uh, he was the, uh, one of the former vice presidents for Heifer International. Um, and he lived here in town, and he heard about this guy in the retreat, and he came out, him and his wife, and, uh, you know, he would just come and just watch, and then he uh, brought us over to have dinner, and he said, hey, I think maybe you should start a nonprofit, right? And up to that point, my only understanding of nonprofit was the fraternity I was in in college, and I did some work at the Urban League when I was in college. So outside of that, I was like, okay, what's that mean? Um, so every Friday for two years, at 6.30 in the morning, he would take me to Stobie's. 6.30 in the morning, Friday. <laughs> and for two hours, he would just educate me on nonprofits and everything about it. And uh, I would get that. I would just go out and follow my face. Literally, like, follow my face, like, that didn't work, that didn't work, that didn't work. And then, over time, uh, began to understand uh, the importance of nonprofits, and, uh, yeah, so. What's that timeline been like? Timeline been like? Yeah. So that, so 2007, we, so from 2008 to about 2010, that's when I was sitting with Mark. Uh, 2009 is when we applied for incorporation. Uh, 2012 is when the organization started to expand. Uh, the owner of Brookside Trailer Park learned what we was doing in the trailer park, and he said, hey, would y'all come over here? Right, so uh, we did that, and then the next, another property owner on South Ash near UCA learned about what we was doing, and they was like, hey, will you come over here? Because we got all this going on. I was like, okay, and then last year, UCA approached us uh, about helping um, communities in South Arkansas. Uh, and so we went to Mitchellville, which is kind of outside of Dumas, um, and we started one up there, and then uh, starting one in Eudora, Arkansas, 
and then uh, helped start nine other nonprofits. Yeah, so, yeah, so I just, so this is my purpose in life. And this is what I do. It's like breathing to me. Yes, ma'am. So, yep. what's your name? Oh, uh, my name is Gifty, and I'm a sophomore. Gifty? Gifty. Gifty, okay. So, Gifty. Okay. Um, <laughs> just um, what advice do you have for those of us who are on a path of, on a vacation that is not necessarily like uh, nonprofit related, but mm -hmm. we want to have that as a part of our lives? Also, what fraternity are you in? <laughs> first, second question first Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. <laughs> yes. So, 1906, yes. Anyway. <laughs> um, I would hope that while you're here at, at Hendrix, you would understand that you are not trying to get a job to make money. Money's going to take care of itself. Okay? Part of our problem, we put money, people, we're money ahead of people. All right? I would hope that you would use your education, okay, as a means to improve your life the life of those within your immediate circle, and that you would use it for society, okay? So, if you are uh, in some of these, in some professions that people wouldn't commonly understand as helping society, but they are, if your calling is to be a lawyer, how are you gonna use the legal profession to improve your life, the life of others, and society? How are you gonna have people understand what justice is? I can have people understand what defending the rights of those who are victims is. How are you going to help people understand that there are just things in life in our society that cannot be tolerated and we have to toe a line because if not, the rest of us are going to suffer. If you're going to be a doctor, the part of the oath, I believe, is to do no harm. What does that look like? As a doctor, whether you are a brain surgeon or a general practitioner, all right, how will you charge people? So if you believe health care is our right, all right, how will that inform how much you charge people to see you? Think about that. If you're a doctor and you believe health care is a right, how will that inform how you will charge people? Are you charging people to maintain your BMW or big house? Right? I'm not sliding that. But that does come into a situation. Just because you're a doctor does not mean you have to be on the high income bracket. Just because you're a lawyer doesn't mean that. Right? We have set up a situation where we have this assumption that certain professions are to make this much money. And that's just the way it's supposed to be. Why? Is it possible, one of the solutions for people to get access to health care is that we act, doctors actually charge less? That their standard of living is not built off of that poor health of somebody else? Now, I know that the whole situation is complex web, but there's some things that we could do or your profession could do to initiate a change. The same thing with the teaching profession. If teaching is something, or education is for every child, what does that mean? What will your education look like? Maybe you shouldn't walk out on a strike. Maybe you should, I don't know. Are you there for a paycheck or are you there for kids? If we want people to be sacrificial, we have to demonstrate sacrifice. If we want people to understand it's not about the money, then how are we going to demonstrate that? Those are the questions we need to wrestle with. Okay. Questions. Who else?
How do you deal What's your name? With, oh, sorry, Cordell Campbell. Um, how do you deal with discouragement? How do I deal with discouragement? Mm -hmm. I go to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> For real, yeah, yeah. I, uh, that is my uh, outlet. I go to gym, I'm an introvert anyway, so I put my headphones on, the whole world just disappears and uh, working out, that's where I can get my stress out. And I listen to, I, I don't listen to music a lot, I listen to lectures, <laughs> you know. It's kind of odd, but that gets me like going. You, know, you, hear, you hear like a thought, and I just be like, oh shoot, and I gotta explore that later, and you know, just keep on going. So I deal with it that way. Uh, now I write a lot um, to get it out that way, um, and then uh, beneath that, I like to watch movies and just take a breath because it's gonna be all right, you know can't save the world. I'm not supposed to. I'm supposed to worry about my own little bit. And obviously prayer, uh, talking to my wife, screaming. <laughs> not at her, but like, <laughs> can you believe this? And all that. And she'll just be like, okay. <laughs> and then I feel better and keep on going again. So that's very helpful. Yeah. But I'll say it's a, uh, it's a, uh, you know, this, what I do can, is not always the most, uh, well, it's, it's rewarding for me. Um, there's some work you can do that's kind of safe, right, when you're working for people, right, and it's not really rocking the boat. For whatever reason God has made me, he's like, yeah, you're going to be that person that's going to poke and prod and ask questions and and you know I've been say you know Philip we don't know where you're coming from like first you're here now all of a sudden you're over here right and I said well you can't put me in a box and in doing that uh, people who you, whom you thought were close to you walk away because you say yeah I don't think police should be shooting black people <laughs> Right. Oh, but I thought you was for you was for the military. Well, I am. I mean, what's that got to do with this, right? Um, I mean, I've had uh, I've lost donors because of positions I've taken, like on some immigration and things like that. Uh, and I have to take a position because one of our communities is primarily Latino and immigrant, and I know their faces and I know their stories and. So I can't just be like, oh, that's a job, right? Because then they become objects. No, they're subjects, they're people. And I've ate with them and had birthday parties with them and so on and so forth. So I have something to say about that because it affects their lives. And you know, if you want to take money from it, I mean, that's your conscience. I'm good. Mine's clear. Uh, so that can be discouraging. But now, after doing this 12 years, uh, as the, as the slang says, it is what it is, you know, and I'm not bothered by it. Yeah. So a question, how do you balance your personal life and responsibilities with the call of like social service that doesn't really stop? So I, when, um, so my day usually starts about 6 in the morning, goes about 8 at night, uh, but as soon as I walk in that door about 8, 15, it just goes off, right? Unless, you know, unless some place is burning down or something. Um, it can wait to the next day because I just want to be, you know, I want to read what I want to read. I want to catch up on some ESPN, see what's going on. Uh, I try to avoid, I try to, I try to avoid Twitter. That's where I get my news. So. <laughs> Then you scroll across, you're like, oh my God. <coughs> so I try to, I don't want to say disconnect, but just kind of be and just enjoy life. And then get back at it again. I say, I'll work, uh, I look forward to Christmas. That's like my two weeks. So I'll go strong 50 weeks, right? But when Christmas comes, that two weeks happen, like, that's like, woo, because I'm going home to see mama and daddy and hang out and just be. And then I'm ready to go for another 50 weeks. 
you know. But part of that's my my military, because you know you go 18 hours straight. It is what it is, you know. So, but uh, self care is very helpful, you know. So you got to be able to you got to be able to know when to say, hey, you know what? It's gonna be all right. God's got this, you know. And you got to trust people; they're gonna make decisions too. And then uh, that next day, just do what you can to help. So. Hey, how do you how do you balance your wife's her own kind of vision and purpose and the things that she does, and then you have three kids? So how do you how do y'all do it all? Uh, they may not know what does. Yeah, yeah. My wife is a labor and delivery birth coach. She delivers babies. Yeah. So it's almost like having a doctor in the house. Like she get calls at two o'clock in the morning. Babies, you know, babies coming, babies coming. So <laughs> that is what it is. Um, so yeah, we've been married going on twenty-two years. Uh, we kind of learned our like the military really shaped who we are as a family. So. Uh, that's seven years. I was probably actually home two. Like, of seven years, two. I was, and that two is broken up. So they kind of learned to function, like, without me, right? Uh, and so we learned to kind of function, like, as a unit, but then independent of each other. But that strengthened, like, our communication, to being able to talk to one another and keeping each other in the loop. Um, so that's kind of like a pattern that we developed now. Uh, my son's at Henderson State. He's a sophomore. Uh, Najee, she's our oldest daughter. She's a senior at the high school. We have one right behind her. Michelle, she's a junior. So now life is like, kind of like, you know, the girls got cars and they got jobs and they just kind of come and go, right? Like, I was thinking about my daughter, Najee. This is the first time, I, this morning, this is the first time I've seen her all week. And I caught her in bed. I was like, baby, I'm leaving. I'm going to Hendrix. She was like, uh, you know, <laughs> right? And uh, that's because our schedules are that way. But then I make time to make sure uh, that we catch up and whatever their favorite thing to do. So Nicole likes to get coffee. Michelle likes to watch movies. And The Office, I still can't get The Office. <laughs> She's just laughing to death. I'm like, I just don't get it. <laughs> and... Uh, Najee, she likes music, so we'll just, she's like, have you listened to DJ, or Khalid? And I'm like, no. She's like, listen to this. <laughs> you know, she likes orchestra too, so we'll chop up different music soundtracks. And she's like, did you get the violin in that? I was like, no, I didn't. <laughs> Let me play it again. So that's how we catch up with each other. And then uh, Sundays we try to all go to church together. Sometimes at work. Work. You know, sometimes it doesn't. So. <coughs> My son, he's just doing his thing at Henderson. He just calls when he needs money. <laughs> and he comes home when he's hungry. Yeah, so. Yeah, he, he plays football at Henderson, so he eats a lot. <laughs> yeah. That's why I'm glad he's not in the house anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? I'll take a hard question. Um, What's your name? Andres. Andres? Senior. Okay, nice to meet you. Um, so you said like focusing on in the political sphere yeah. is vital. Yeah. Um, where do you see like the biggest challenges within doing that? Whether on like the local level or state or federal? I, so on the local level, it's easy because um, like our mayor and city council they're pretty accessible okay uh, if you know who they are and their faces you're gonna pr more likely see them around town at some point okay or if y'all have some thing here like with president and you have some big opening more than likely some of them gonna be here right um, this opportunity their city council meetings are on every other Tuesday just to go Listen to the meetings and talk to them. Ask them questions. All right. Look at the uh, the ordinances that are being proposed and ask them those questions. Like, why are we doing this? Okay. Um, now, as you move up 
government, so from the county, they're still pretty accessible. And we get to that state and federal, all right? Money's a big voice. Let's just call it what it is, all right? And so you have to work hard at getting that state senator or state representative to sit down and be like, hey, I need you to hear this from this perspective before you cast this vote to move it out of committee and then onto the, to the larger floor, okay? Once again, be informed, okay? I mean, if you gotta come with your one little sheet of cheat sheet and just read it word for word, then do that. But come informed. I think one of the most uh, unhelpful things is just coming to shout at a legislature legislator or senator. I mean, if you shout at me inside, I've turned you off. I mean, are we, right? Most people, if I started shouting at you, you kind of just turn me off. But if I sit down with you as a reasonable, rational person with another reasonable, rational person, and I lay out facts and so on and so forth, you gain the respect of that man or woman and when they see you again, they want to hear you again, right? So we have to get, we have to recover uh, being decent to one another, even our politicians, okay? Contextually, you know, this state, uh, we'll, I'll back up. So citywide, it's a, it's, the elected leaders are kind of progressive, all right? Countywide, it gets more conservative. Statewide, it's a red state. Okay, so if you're not, if you're, if you're like a blue person or a purple person, kind of a mix of the two, if you're blue or you're like green or libertarian, right? Are you seeking to win an argument and beat a person down? Or are you seeking to be heard? And I would say, seek to be heard. And seeking to be heard means, hey, sir or ma'am, here's what I want to bring to you. Will you please consider this? This is what the research is. I live in your said area. I'm one of your constituents. I didn't vote for you, <laughs> but I'm still one of your constituents. And by virtue of me being one of your constituents, I look at it this way. You work for me. I mean, really the public service. And so um, hear what at least consider what it is that I have to say. You don't have to agree, you don't have to vote my way, but at least consider what it is that I have to say. Um, if you can do that by yourself, or you can get a group of you together. But once again, if it's a group of you, go rationally and reasonably, right, so that you can be heard. Alright? Um, there's a time and a place for more, mm, right? But that's after every other element I think has been exhausted. And I think, some, I think we've moved too fast over here instead of sitting down and being like, hey, you know what? Let's get coffee, man. I, last year I uh, interviewed all the, well, the majority of the persons that were running for office from the city all the way up to Jared Henderson, and Asa, Asa Hutchinson, and then French Hill. All right, all of them, I agree with everything they said, right? I give them the opportunity to be heard, okay? Even the ones I did not disagree with, did, did, did not agree with, excuse me, um, I could understand where they were coming from, okay? Um, there was another case. Uh, it was when Congressman French Hill had come and I interviewed him uh, and his opponents, uh, supporters had come. They wanted to shut down the Round Mountain Coffee. That's where it was, right? They wanted to stage a protest inside. And I tried to explain to him, I was like, hey, they just let me hold the place here, uh, hold the interview here. They have nothing to do with what's going on. So for you to try to shut down their business, who are you helping, right? They got to work. There's kids here just trying to study, right? I understand what you're trying to do, but there's a better way to do it, 
right? Um, and so uh, overall, uh, I think we need to be rational and reasonable. I think we need to uh, do the long, hard work uh, to be heard. And I think uh, at the end of the day, like I said before, we have to remember that we're human beings tied together. And even if I don't agree with you, I need to seek to affirm your dignity and worth. Yes. Even, even good old 45. He's a human being made in the image and likeness of God. Good old 45 has dignity and worth. Good old 45. <laughs> Just like good old governor of Virginia with black faces. And Plan has dignity and worth. Y'all see how difficult that is? Right? You just want, oh, what? <laughs> but it's it, but that's what it comes down to. I cannot. So the governor. I don't know how I got it's because it's yeah. Um so the governor is 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 demonstrating images that uh, convey the denigration and dehumanization of, of people. But I have to remember, even when he's denig well, at that time, denigrating uh, the dignity and worth of people who look like me, I have to still say, this man has dignity and worth. And that when I start there, then that shapes how I approach him. Because if I didn't uh, if I didn't think he had dignity and worth, so this is Philip 2006, still in the military, I'd be like, this joker is about to be dealt with. <laughs> I'm not looking at him as a human being. I'm looking at him as an object, right? But Philip now is like, he is my neighbor, as Jesus said. He is on the Jericho Road. And I need to help him. And that's hard for us, I think. But imagine how our society would be if we treated people that way. I'm Ryan, I'm a senior here. Yes. Um, so I think there are a lot of people that do see other people as having, you know, worth and, mm -hmm. and you know, as and loving others and everything, but I feel like a lot of people don't. Yeah. And I have this fear that <clears throat> there's not going to be, you know, the change that we all want to see unless there's a complete buy-in, like a complete, you know, like vulnerability on the account of everybody just to start over. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do how do you go about doing that, or do you think that's wrong to have that fear that it can't get better unless it is full buy-in? No, I'm not going to ever tell you wrong to have fear. That just shows you're human. All right, that shows that you are acknowledging the difficulty that's going on right now. All right, so I affirm your fear. Okay, all right. Um, now what do we do with that here? Will we have complete buy-in? No, we will not. All right? So I have to be realistic. OK? In uh, any society, there's never complete buy-in. OK? I can go through history that by virtue of human conflict, somebody doesn't have buy-in. OK? Um, but can we move a, ma a majority of the people that have buy-in? I believe that we can, okay? So I'm distinguishing, uh, I am hopeful, I'm not optimist, I'm hopeful, okay? Uh, I am hopeful uh, that when a majority of the people have a buy-in that we have dignity and worth, all right? And you don't have to have a religious perspective about that, but if you can just affirm the reality that every human being, um, is equal at a base level, all right? And if we could start there, if we could actualize truly what is in that Declaration of Independence, if like we would actually 
believe that and carry it out, um, then there would be some changes that would happen, right? I think if we did that, I think the Constitution would have to change in some form. Right? I mean, that's the document that organizes our society, right? So that's what binds us together as a, a group. It's our contractual document. So if we really believe, the majority of the people really believe that all men are created equal, all right, then that means we'll have some more amendments that will flow out of the Constitution because it's going to take a majority of elected officials to, excuse me, states, to affirm that constitutional change, okay? Now, what would that look like? I've made the argument that the reason the health care issue is so difficult is because it's not constitutional. It's not enshrined in our Constitution. If it was enshrined in our Constitution, it would be a whole completely different thing. But because the way our society is structured and the Constitution that we have, that's why you have this clash. You have those that say, right, um, well, it's not a constitutional right. Well, so they're making a right argument because it's not in the Constitution. But if you go to some other countries, it's in their Constitution. And there's just nothing you can, it's, that's what that society has agreed upon, all right? Um, same thing for education and some of these other things that we uh, wrestle with. Um, so if we begin with understanding that the majority of us, and if we move to making some changes in some of our organizing documents, whether at the city, state, or the federal level, then I think we'll begin to move toward what you're talking about. But we'll even still have some issues, right? And that's just part of the human experience. Uh, that's going to cause us once again to be, go back and say, hey, what does it mean to be human, even in the midst of conflict? So I would tell you, sir, be hopeful. All right, and you do your part, okay? And when you leave this place and you go to your uh, whatever occupation you're gonna do and when you have a family and all that, you have that direct influence to make those changes. Anybody else? Okay. I hope I was helpful. Stuff. Um, coho58.org is our website. If you're looking for an internship, hey, like I said, I've had great Hendrix interns. Y'all have not failed me yet. Um, and so, JJ, thank you. Thank you. For the opportunity.